Hello and welcome to episode 44 of the Monday Night Review. I hope you're all well. We are careering towards the end of this, the term here and there is a violent sick bug going around so uh, my house is having to deal with my severe emetophobia <laughs> causing havoc. So I hope you're all well and not dealing with the same it's a horror of parenting that I wasn't prepared for. I'd like to do a shout out this week to Hannah who very sweetly bought me a book um, using the buy me a coffee link. I really appreciate it and I actually already... <laughs> Already, already put that towards some reading, um, which I will share on the blog. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. Um, and I'd also like to say a big hello to Helen and David, who are the most recent Patreon subscribers. I'm having a little bit of a cheat today because we're back on the London Tube, A to Z of London Tubes, and we're at Archway, which actually is where my husband lived for a couple of years. And uh, it's a fairly gritty part of north london and uh a lot of things there are a bit a bit recent bit a bit much for this podcast so i'm using my artistic license today and we're going to talk about possibly one of the most famous london murderers though i mean i don't know why because there are very many serial offenders and this guy isn't one but today we're going to talk about dr hawley harvey crippen so, Dr. Crippen, we can't even take credit for him, us Brits. He's actually born in Coldwater, Michigan. He's the son of a merchant, and he went to the University of Michigan Homeopathic Medical School and graduated from the Cleveland Homeopathic Medical College in 1884. He married Charlotte, and they had a son who's called Hawley Otto, known as Otto, but Charlotte dies of a stroke in 1892 and after his wife's death, Crippen entrusts his parents who live in California to, with the care of his two-year-old son, which I don't think is unusual for the time for a widower to hand over his children um, so that they can work and because it's not a man's job raising children. Uh, so then Crippen meets his second wife, 17-year-old, Corinne Cora Turner in New York where he's working as a qualified homeopath now they get married in 1894 so that's two years after his first wife's death and Cora is a singer she performs under the stage name Belle Elmore but she seems to have been this really vivacious and ambitious character and it's rumored that she was basically having affairs from the start of their marriage which was sort of overlooked or put up with by Crippen. Throughout their marriage, Crippen paid for Cora to have singing lessons, anything she needed to further her career as an opera singer, but eventually it became apparent she was more suited to the musical stage. Her career never quite flourished in the way that she would, but she seems to have been a very dynamic personality who made lots of friends in the business and was sort of well-liked wherever she went. Also in 1984, Crippen starts working for Dr. Dr. Munions, which is a homeopathic pharmaceutical company. So in 1897, the Crippins move to England, where his US medical qualifications are not going to allow him to practice as doctor, but he continues working as a distributor for Dr. Munions' homeopathic pharmaceutical company. So Cora socialised with variety players at the time, including Lil Hawthorne of the Hawthorne Sisters and her Lil's husband, manager John Nash. They, she seems to have just, although she didn't seem to make it on the stage, she just seems to have been a real good friend to lots of performers. She, though her career didn't take off as she would wish, she made no appearances on the stage after about 1907. She was incredibly popular in the business and she became the honorary treasurer of the charitable society, the Music Hall Ladies Guild. And it's actually these friends who see to it that when she disappears, it's not unnoticed. So Crippen gets sacked by Munions in 1899 for spending too much time managing his wife's stage career. Kind of, to me, implies that their marriage can't have been that terrible if he's devoting all this time to managing her career, but it possibly is that they just have a unusual marriage that was not very conventional for the time. 
So he becomes a manager at Drutz Institution for the Deaf, and here he hires Ethel Leneve, a young typist. He hires her in 1902, and she's a quiet and reserved woman of about 20. She's seemingly the opposite of the flamboyant Cora. And they, what is often referred to as come to an understanding. So the Crippins have lived all over the place. And they finally move in 1905 to 39 Hilldrop Crescent, Camden Road, Holloway in London. And they take in lodges to make up for the the small income that Crippen's living on. And Cora has an affair with one of these lodges and that seems to give Crippen the go-ahead to take Leneve as his mistress in 1908. So in 1910, Crippen would say that they kept up the public appearance of the happy marriage, but they had frequent arguments and had ceased sleeping together. Again, it could be that this was part of their marriage. He had a mistress, she was having affairs. They, it kind of worked, but obviously for the time, it wasn't an acceptable way to go about things. On the 31st of January 1910, the Crippins have a dinner party at their home and the guests include Clara and Paul Martinetti, who is a former musical artist. The Martinettis leave at about 1.30 in the morning. Obviously, the dinner party had been fun. They'd noticed nothing unusual in the Crippin home. And they are the last people to see Cora. After this evening, she just disappears. So when she fails to attend a meeting at the Guild on the 2nd of February, the secretary, Melinda May, comes, becomes concerned and goes to the house on Hildrock Crescent to see if Cora is OK. The door is opened by Ethel Leneve, who hands May two letters. One is addressed to May and one is addressed to the committee. And they both basically say that Cora has had to return to America to attend to an ill relative. The letter to the committee contains all the treasury documents. So it's obvious that, you know, she's saying she's had a last minute decision to go back to America. She's not able to carry on her work at the Guild. But what's really notable is neither letter is written in Cora's handwriting. So the same day, Crippen goes to a local pawn shop with some of Cora's jewellery and he goes again one week later. And Cora's many friends wait to hear from her. When they hear that she's gone back to America, they wait for a postcard or any, any news from her, but no correspondence comes. And bizarrely, on the 20th of February, Crippen takes Leneve to a ball where there are lots of Cora, uh, Cora's friends present, including Clara Martinetti, who realises that Leneve is wearing one of Cora's brooches. So Clara asks after Cora, and Crippen says she's reached California, but she's been taken ill a month after this. So in March, he writes to the Martinetti saying that Cora is now dangerously ill with pneumonia. And five days later, he sends them a telegram to say that she's died. Meanwhile, Ethel is seen wearing Cora's clothes and jewellery and Cora's friends become suspicious. Something does not sit right with them. So the first thing they do is to contact Otto Crippen, who is the son from Crippen's first marriage, and he lives in Los Angeles. And they ask about Cora's death, and they're told... He responds saying that he was told she died in San Francisco, not L.A. So the Guild then make further inquiries and find that no woman called Crippen has died in San Francisco. So, of course, she could be using another name. She could be using the name of the man she has allegedly run off with. She could be using her stage name. She could be using her maiden name. <clears throat> and then theatrical manager John Nash and his wife, Lil Hawthorne, who have been abroad during this time, return to London and are told of Cora's disappearance and illness and death. And they are also suspicious, especially that they haven't heard from her in the interim before her death and they go and speak to their friend 
Superintendent Frost at Scotland Yard. And he introduces them to Inspector Walter Dew, who is going to look into the case for them. The police have already been notified um, that there is concern for Cora by strong woman Kate Williams, who's better known as Volcana. And so that this is sort of the, the the impetus they need to really look into the case. They They basically believe that it's a bohemian type of living because of Cora being involved in the stage and therefore there's probably a very reasonable explanation. But Jew starts interviewing Cora's friends and with Detective Sergeant Mitchell goes to the Crippen house. Now, Ethel Leneve answers the doors and the door and she's wearing one of Cora's brooches and she tells the police that she's the housekeeper and that Crippen's not in, he's at work. So after much persuading, she really reluctantly takes them to his office where Crippen admits that Cora's death is a lie and that she has in fact left him for musical artist Bruce Miller and they are living in Chicago. Um, Ethel believes that Cora's gone to America, which is why she agreed to move in. She agrees that she isn't, she, she admits that she isn't the housekeeper and that she's living with Crippen. And Crippen comes across as very relaxed and calm. It doesn't seem unreasonable at that time that he would want to save face and not have the embarrassment of having been left for another man. So it, it's better for him to say that she's dead. But um, after the interview, the Crippen and Leneve and the police officers return to Hildrock Crescent and they do a search of the house. Jew's satisfied with Crippen's story. He says that he felt drawn to the cellar, but there's nothing down there. And he leaves. And he says the best way to sort this all out is for us to track down Cora. And he, he feels uneasy about it. So he decides on the 11th of July, he returns to the house to find Crippen and Ethel have gone out. A maid lets them in and says that apparently Crippen and Ethel have left the day after that police interview and haven't returned. So the police are able to search the house again. And this time they find a loaded revolver and some cartridges in a cupboard. And they'd searched the cupboard before and it wasn't there. So they believe that it must have been on Crippen's person when they spoke to him initially. And why would you not mention it? Why was it hidden before? Um, And this is when Jew becomes convinced that something's happened to Cora. Where have... Crippen and Ethel gone why is the gun suddenly turned up so he circulates he circulates descriptions of Crippen and Ethel uh, especially to the ports everyone being notified to keep an eye out Crippen's described as being five foot three or four sandy hair going bald on top a scanty straggling moustache while Ethel is five foot five with a pleasing appearance and quiet subdued manner so With Crippen and Ethel on the lam, the police are able to conduct a third, really thorough search of Hildrock Crescent, and the Jew is finally able to satisfy his curiosity of the cellar. So they've dug up the garden, and Jew then goes down with another officer, and they prod the cellar floor with a poker, and they find some loose bricks. And these were pulled up to reveal a layer of clay, And once that's removed, they reveal a mass of decomposing flesh, which must have been horrendous. So when excavated, they find the boneless flesh of a human. They can't see any obvious cause of death, but they do also find a hair curler with some hair the same colour as Cora's attached, some ladies' underclothes and a pyjama jacket found to match trousers in Crippen's bedroom. William Wilcox, who's later um, senior scientific analyst at the Home Office, finds traces of the calming drug scopolamine in the torso. And the remains are identified as belonging to Cora because there's a piece of skin from the abdomen. 
um, that has a scar on it that matches a scar that Cora had from an operation. The head, limbs and skeleton are never recovered. Uh, the press go wild. It's a slow summer and this is big news. So it's the topic of conversation all over England. Um, an assistant from Crippen's work comes forward saying that Crippen had come into the office the day after the police interview and had sent him out to buy a set of boys' clothing. So people are reporting sightings of Crippen and Ethel all over London, when in fact they'd already made it abroad. So Crippen and Leneve had fled in panic to Brussels. They spent a night in a hotel, and then the following day they went to Antwerp and boarded the Canadian Pacific liner SS Montrose for Canada, and they travel as John Robinson and son. So despite Ethel being disguised as a boy, Captain Henry George Kendall soon suspects them, and just before they get out of range of his shipboard transmitter... His telegraphist, Lawrence Ernest Hughes, sends a wireless telegram to the British authorities saying, has strong suspicion that Crippen, London, cellar murderer and accomplice are among saloon passengers. Moustache taken off, growing beard. Accomplice dressed as a boy. Manner and build, undoubtedly a girl. And this is the first time that telegraph has been used to catch a criminal. One of the many mistakes that Crippen makes is that had he travelled third class, he wouldn't have come into contact with the captain and he probably would have escaped Kendall's notice. So Jew gets sent um, to track down Crippen. He goes on a faster White Star liner, the SS Laurentic from Liverpool. And this is leaked to the press, causing even more sensation. It becomes like this race to catch the murderer. And when the Laurentic arrives in Quebec on the 29th of July, head of Crippen, Jew, is met by a mass of press reporters. As the Montrose enters the St. Lawrence River, Jew is rowed out to the ship, um, disguised as a pilot, and um, bizarrely, another mistake, Canada is then part of the British Empire, if Crippen, who was an American, had gone to the US instead, even if he'd been recognised, he would have, it would have taken a lot of extradition proceedings to bring him to trial. Whereas because he went to Canada, he's in basically in in British uh, power. So Kendall invites Crippen to meet the pilots as they come aboard and Jew apparently removes his pilot's cap and says good morning Dr Crippen do you know me I'm Chief Inspector Jew from Scotland Yard to which Crippen apparently replies thank god it's over the suspense has been too great I can't stand it any longer and he holds out his wrist for handcuffs when Crippen is searched they find some of Cora's jewellery and a note suggesting that Crippen intended to commit suicide by jumping overboard though he hadn't done it already so I don't know if that was part of the plot for him to pretend that he jumped overboard Um, but it seems a bit odd so Jew escorts Crippen and Ethel back to the UK on board the SS Megantic no further remains are found at Hilldrop Crescent but the dustman recalls that in February he'd been asked by Crippen to remove an unusually large amount of material including some that had been burnt, and neighbours reported hearing screams and even gunshots. Though obviously, with all the media sensation that had gone on, it's hard to know what to believe about that. So Crippen is tried at the Old Bailey before uh, Lord Chief Justice Lord Alveston on the 18th of October 1910, and the proceedings last just four days. The first prosecution witnesses are pathologists, and one of them is Bernard Spilsbury, who is later the famous uh, Bernard Spilsbury, and he testifies that they can't identify the torso remains, and they can't really even tell whether the remains are male or female. But Spilsbury has found a piece of skin which he claimed to be a scar consistent with Cora's medical history, Large quantities of the toxic compound scopalamine are found in the remains 
And Crippen had purchased this drug in large quantities on the 19th of January from a local chemist. So that's not great for Crippen. Um, Crippen's defence maintained that Cora had fled to America with another man, Bruce Miller, and that Cora and Crippen had been living at the house only since 1905, which might suggest that the previous owner was responsible for the placement of the remains. They also asserted that the abdominal scar identified by the pathologist was was just folded tissue. It had hair follicles growing from it, which wouldn't happen in a scar. Uh, and, and spills would be countered by saying that there were sebaceous glands at the end, but not in the middle of the scar. Um, they ha- the 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 defence had wished that that Scrippin would igno- would admit to poisoning his wife but only in order to sedate her and that she died by accident. But Crippen refused to do this, knowing that Ethel would then be deemed and tried as an accomplice to murder. So other evidence presented by the prosecution includes a piece of the man's pyjama top, supposedly from a pair Cora had given Crippen a year earlier. The pyjama bottoms are found in Crippen's bedroom. And this includes the manufacturer's label which is jones brothers the testimony from jones brothers representative says that the product was not sold prior to 1908 they could date the manufacturer well within the time frame of when the crippins were living in the house and when cora gave the pajamas to crippin um so if if, as the defence suggested, the remains had been there before Crippen, how had the pyjama shirt got there? And indeed, if it wasn't Cora, who is it? And it just seems the pyjama top, it, it doesn't look good for Crippen. Throughout the proceedings and his sentencing, Crippen shows absolutely no remorse or concern for his wife. He only really cares about Ethel's reputation. He never even mentions Cora by name. He refers to her as the woman, um, which I think really shows disassociation from the crime. It must be quite full on to dismember and fill it to someone. So I can imagine a, a disassociation there would fit from my very slim knowledge of that kind of thing. But also... I would hope that my husband would be concerned about where I was um, or would be trying to track me down. Um, The jury found Crippen guilty of murder in under 27 minutes. And Leneve is charged only with being an accessory after the fact and she's acquitted. So Crippen never gives a reason for killing his wife. There are several theories that have been bandied around and one... um, one is that the Victorian barrister Edward Marshall Hall, Marshall Hall believes that Crippen was using drugs to as an anaphrodisiac for his wife, but accidentally gave her an overdose and then panicked when she died. Um, the day before Crippen's executed, he sends a long letter to Ethel, a lot of which is given over to the assertion that the the body in the cellar is not his wife. Um, and Crippen is hanged by John Ellis at Pentonville Prison on Wednesday, 23rd of November, 1910, at nine o'clock in the morning. Leneve sails to the United States before settling in in Canada, finding work as a typist. She returns to Britain in 1915 and dies in 1967. Um, At Crippen's request, a photograph of her is placed in his coffin and buried with him. He's in an unmarked grave in Pentonville's grounds though allegedly there is a rose bush planted over his grave. Some of his relatives in Michigan have been lobbying for his remains to be repatriated to the United States, but that has not happened. In 1981, several British newspapers reported that Sir Hugh Rees Rankin claimed to have met Ethel Neneve in 1930 in Australia, where she told him that Crippen had murdered his wife because she had syphilis. So questions have risen i mean it's one of it's a very well talked about historical event dawnford yates was a junior barrister at the original trial and he notes that although crippen placed the torso in dry quicklime to be destroyed he didn't realize that it became wet 
that when it became wet, it would be turned into slate lime, which is basically a preservative. Uh, so that's why they were able to see the scar and everything. And actually Yeats used this, this in the plot of his novel, The House That Berry Built. To me, it seems really strange that you would successfully get rid of the head and the limbs and the skeleton, but you would choose to bury the flesh under the cellar floor. Um, arguably, the flesh is the... I'm sorry to talk about this. Is the, is the easiest bit to get rid of. Also, poisoners usually poison to pass it off as natural causes or an overdose or an accident. Dismembering doesn't really fit with poisoning. And where does the gun come in? Why hide the gun and then put it back or not mention it? Did he drug her, shoot her, dismember her? Um, in October 2007, Michigan State University forensic scientist David Foran claimed that mitochondrial DNA evidence shows that the remains found beneath Crippen's cellar floor were not those of his wife, Cora Crippen. They used genealogy to find three great nieces and it doesn't match theirs and it says that the DNA is possibly... It is most likely to be a man. So the same research team also argued that the scar found on the torso um, was incorrectly identified and that there are hair follicles there which wouldn't be present in scars, which was mentioned at Crippen's defence, for Crippen's defence at his trial. And this research is published. However, this has been disputed. Journalist David Aranovich writes, um, as to the body being male, well, the American team was using a special technique that is very new and done only by his team and working on a single century old slide described by the team leader as less than optimal sample. The foreign says that the tests show that it's definitely a male and Crippen maintained his innocence at the end. But then, you know, there are certain things when he's caught, he's relieved. He says, thank goodness it's over. Or was he just relieved to not be on the run anymore? Why run if there isn't something going on? Also, where is his wife? He's very sure that she's not coming back. The, the traces of the blonde hair that's found in the curlers at the scene are now preserved in the Metropolitan Police Crime Museum. Another researcher said that they asked for samples for DNA testing, but this has been denied several times. Um... However, New Scotland Yard said they were willing to test a hair from the crime scene for a fee, which has been re rejected by investigators as over the top. So who knows what's going on there? Um, some people say that the police planted body parts to incriminate Crippen, but I, I don't know why they would. I mean, the, an independent observer points out that the case didn't really become public until the remains were found. There was, there was nothing to report on. Um, I think if you successfully get rid of the majority of the body and you've buried the remains under the cellar floor and bricked it over, why would you think you were going to be caught? Why would... I, I think if he'd played it more cleverly, if he hadn't moved his mistress in, if she wasn't wearing Cora's clothes and jewellery, if he'd been more sensible in his forgery of correspondence, uh, he may well have gotten away with it. They, you know, they were both known to be having affairs. It would seem reasonable that Cora had left also, with all the media sensation, it's bizarre that Cora never came forward. She was never came forward. She was never found. She was never seen. Um, some stories have it that the police intercepted a letter from Cora saying that she was alive and well, but not going to come forward to save his life. And this letter was never shown to Crippen, who it's addressed to, or his lawyers. And the police say they believe it was a hoax, which it probably was. There's just no evidence that the Crippens disliked each other. She was the first to have affairs. He lost his job for spending too much time trying to manage her stage career. I think it, I think he did kill her. And I think that body in the cellar probably is hers. Um, and I think it's just that he... Maybe she was refusing a divorce. I don't know. So in December 2009, the UK's Criminal Cases... Well, UK's Criminal Cases Review Commission 
reviewed the case and declared that the Court of Appeal will not hear the case to pardon Crippen posthumously. The thing for me is whether or not the remains uh, that were found belong to Cora or not, the fact is that after the 31st of January 1910, Crippen acts as though his wife will not be returning home. And a woman who is as flamboyant as Cora doesn't leave all her clothing and jewellery behind if she runs off with another man. Um, m- you know, maybe she won't take it all, but she seems to have left all her clothing, all her jewellery behind. He seems very sure that she's not coming back. He's comfortable to let his mistress wear her clothes and her jewellery. Um, he, as soon as people are questioning what's going on, he already has letters ready to give to the ladies of the guild he has the documents uh, on the 2nd of february uh, he has the documents ready to hand over to the secretary of the guild that have all her treasurer's documents so there's no confirmed sighting of cora crippen after the 31st of january and between then and when ethel moved into hilldrop crescent crippen has six weeks to dispose of the body so to me it all fits and that is the story of dr crippen i hope you enjoyed this episode um i love going on on a tube journey i also love receiving your suggestions so thank you to everyone who's emailed the monday night review at gmail.com to everyone who has followed us on instagram and facebook where we are of course the monday night review and where you can see pictures that go with each episode also we have a website we have a patreon you can buy me a book so i can do more research and thank you so much for listening and as always until next time be kind stay safe and always check the back seats before you drive